The impact of Dr. Graham's example of research excellence persists in his continuing example to all of us and in this annual lecture. Further, as he pointed out in an interview that we did with him when we first put the lectureship together, Saxon considered the impact that he had on the students and other mentees that he worked with one of the most important parts of his legacy. In recognition of that life legacy, we have two graduate student awards that have been funded by generous gifts in his name from alumni, faculty, and friends. So it's my honor today to announce the winner of this year's Saxon Graham Award for overall academic excellence. So um, normally I would hand a certificate to this student. I don't know if we can even get her to show up. I'm not sure if you can see her. Um, the award this year goes to a recent graduate of our epidemiology PhD. It's a recognition of overall excellence in all aspects of the program, including the quality of the research. The student must have had active engagement in data collection. I'm very pleased to announce that this year's Saxon Graham Award for overall academic excellence goes to Dr. Zainab Farhat. Zainab was a fellow on our T32 training grant and did her research under the mentorship of Dr. Lena Mu. Others on her committee were Dr. Lamont, Dr. Hageman Blair in biostatistics, Dr. Mammon in critical care medicine, as well as I was my, it was my pleasure also to serve on her committee. A requirement of the, the award is that the student has done substantial data collection. Zainab clearly met that requirement. Her dissertation focused on understanding the potential role of garlic consumption on cancer, particularly lung cancer. Her work included a series of laboratory studies on cell cultures, a double blind um, pilot intervention study, examining oxidative effects of a garlic supplement, as well as a secondary data analysis of prospective data. Zainab is an outstanding example of the extent to which our work in epidemiology is greatly enhanced when it's interdisciplinary. In her dissertation research, she did a tremendous job of integrating epidemiology and basic science research. She is now a cancer prevention postdoctoral fellow in the highly competitive training program at the National Cancer Institute. We're very proud of Zainab and her accomplishments. Please join me in congratulating her as I hand her this virtual certificate. So it's really terrific. Um, and Zainab put in the chat, at least thank you to everybody. <laughs> I, I, there must be a way to do this more elegantly, I'm sorry. But anyway, it's really my great pleasure to give her this award. So now the second award that I want to recognize, there are two recipients this year of the Saxon Graham Research Award, and they are Kishan Zhu and Seth Fernandak. Uh, the Saxon Graham Research Award is a wonderful resource in that it provides funds for doctoral students for their research. The award was initiated by Dr. Graham, his son Saxon Graham Jr., and Dr. James Marshall. The award provides funds to assist PhD students in their dissertation research. Both Seth and Kishen are outstanding students in our program. Both are doing exceptional work, bringing new insights to the research they're doing. We're very proud of both of them and their accomplishments. I fully expect to hear more about their continuing successes as they move on in the program and in their careers. Please join me in congratulating both Kishen and Seth as I hand each of them their virtual certificate. Wonderful congratulations. It's such a pleasure to be able to celebrate our students and former students. So now it's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Polly Newcomb, our Saxon Graham lecturer for 2021. Dr. Newcomb did her doctoral work at the University of Washington and then was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I met her when I was doing my doctorate. In her time in Wisconsin, she established an impactful ongoing case control study of breast cancer, eventually combining her research with several other studies in the Collaborative Women's Health Study. In more than three decades under her leadership, that study has resulted in very significant contribution to our understanding of breast cancer epidemiology. For almost any topic that I read about with regard to breast cancer epidemiology, that group has a contribution that changes the field, it's well thought, and completely um, has enormous impact in our thinking. 
So Dr. Polly Newcomb is now a full professor and former head of the cancer prevention program at the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Research Center. She also has an appointment as a research professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the University of Washington School of Public Health. For over 30 years, Dr. Newcomb has led an active epidemiology research program focused on cancer genetics, etiology, screening, and survival. Her research interests include genetic factors, intratumoral molecular markers, modifiable risk factors associated with both colon cancer and breast cancer incidence and survival. Dr. Newcomb serves as the principal investigator for several colorectal cancer cohorts, including the Puget Sound Colorectal Cancer Cohort and the Colorectal Cancer Family Registry, an international multi-site study of the genetic epidemiology of colorectal cancer. Her research has res resulted in an astounding nearly 600 publications supported by over 40 grants and contracts. She also maintains a faculty position at the University of Wisconsin, where she served as the program head of the Cancer Control Program at the Cancer Center. She's been on, the edit on editorial boards for the American Journal of Epidemiology and for Cancer Epidemiology cancer epidemiology, biomarkers, and prevention. She recently completed a term as the president of the American Society for Preventive Oncology, and she was the recipient of the Distinguished Achievement Award from ASPO. Dr. Newcomb has mentored more than 50 students, fellows, and junior faculty, and has received numerous mentoring awards. When I see her, I'm always impressed with how she makes mentoring a priority and the engaged way she interacts with her mentee. Her talk today is about her recent research interests in a growing new exposure, cannabis. I'm very pleased to introduce Dr. Newcomb, who is an amazing leader and scholar. Her talk is Cannabis and Cancer, Lessons Learned and Future Paths. Please give a warm welcome to our 2021 Saxon Graham lecturer, Dr. Polly Newcomb. Thank you, Joe, for those kind words. And thank you for the invitation to come to Buffalo. I'm gonna have a great time when I have to get there. Um, today, I'm very pleased to join you all to talk about an emerging exposure, its relationship to cancer prevention and the challenges in securing funding and conducting this research. So this is a picture when I started my work at the University of Wisconsin and I pretty much look like that today, don't I, Joe? Um, but the truth is, I believed um, that modifiable risk factors, if we could understand more about what risk factors were important in cancer and were modifiable, we could provide that information to patients and, and to their physicians. They could base decisions regarding behavior. We might learn more about the tumor. It was a, um, a very Pollyanna vision of what we could do in terms of impacting the cancer burden. The truth is, I think I'm at the end of the road for finding modifiable risk factors. According to screening, as so I think we've already taken out the low hanging fruit and I've been doing this for 30 years and I feel like the easy things are done. And I think that, that Dr. Graham, um, and I never had the pleasure to meet him, but he really, he filled the whole bottom row here. He took care of tobacco and nutrition. Um, and, and I've been doing this for 30 years and I think pretty much we're done with easy identification. We do need to look beyond what we already know. So we can fill a whole book of cancer epidemiology of known risk factors. They're not all modifiable, but I think we need to start thinking, continue to think about new risk factors. Environmental contaminants, I've, I've dabbled in this a little bit in Wisconsin actually in looking at heavy metals, uh, sleep and light. I think we all think sleep is a lot more important now. Um, we're doing a lot more of it now. Um, the microbiome, stress, social interactions about where you live, climate change, and I've never really done anything with climate change yet. Um, but I think we need to look beyond what we already know, beyond those low hanging fruit. And what else is there? So I'm actually very enthusiastic about a brand new exposure and uh, in epidemiology, I think probably when Dr. Graham started looking at tobacco and nutrition, certainly we knew that all of those things were 
present in our life, but we didn't know if it might play a role in um, cancer. So what is cannabis? I'll tell you right off, I've done a little um, field work on this one. So when I go to a cannabis store in Seattle, a retail outlet, um, the first thing as an ingenue, I went in and I said, so I'm doing a research project on marijuana. First thing they said was, don't call it marijuana, it's cannabis. Marijuana is a slang name. Um, but cannabis is known by so many different things and it, it's increasingly, as you'll see, pervasive, and increasingly um, integrated into life in America. In fact, times are changing. So 47 states have at least some legal use of cannabis. You can only see three states there, Idaho, um, North Dakota, and um, Kansas that have absolutely no cannabis. And um, nearly 15, I think 15 states, and New York will, has joined that group. Um, three states um, approve cannabis in this a legislative session. Um, in these 15 states, um, cannabis is, re is available um, freely and always to adults, 18 and over. So I'd like to review the epidemiology today of what cannabis is, um, who uses cannabis, a little bit about policy because I think it's pretty interesting, um, the health effects of cannabis and a case uh, study of my exposure to initiating, um, a, trying to initiate a research program in cannabis research. And I like to frankly, unfortunately, present some of my approaches, um, dead end approaches, but I think it's learning. You can tell it hasn't been an easy scientific climb for me. Um, and uh, cannabis epi is one of the oldest cultivated plants um, in the world. Uh, in civilization, there have been um, about 500, um, 5,000 years of cannabis use. It's been used um, for food, for clothing, for animal feed, um, and of course, um, for medicinal and um, psychoactive properties. So what is cannabis? Uh, cannabinoids are a class of pharmacologic compounds, both endogenous and uh, exogenous, um, as you can see in the plants, but also endogenous, which I'll talk a little bit later. The pharmacologic um, active agent of um, alpha tetrahydrocannabinol cannabinol is um, the psychoactive um, component. It's a major um, uh, retail um, commercial product. Or and CBD. These two um, major products bind to the cannabinoid receptors in the body, um, which is part of the endocannabinoid system. Some strains contain more or less um, THC or CBD, um, and cannabinoids can be also, many other compounds can be isolated um, from the plant. And you can see um, there are more than 100 active cannabinoid forms. I'm obviously not a, a pharmacoepidemiologist, um, but the most commercially relevant and for our, our term, terms, our terms are THC and um, CBD. So how cannabis is used today um, in Seattle, um, pretty much across um, the US, um, there's more than um, the most uh, recognized form. You can smell when somebody's smoking um, marijuana, um, but there's water pipes, there's eating, there's drinking, there's vaporizing, which is um, increasingly used. There's creams, there's patches, there's suppositories. Um, and this was another part of my field work. Um, this is a store in Seattle called Uncle Ike's, which is actually a chain. So there's a chain of retail outlets um, for cannabis and it's a pretty glossy store and they have menus and um, uh, it, it is um, important to realize and I, again, doing my um, field work, you can't use um, anything but cash in um, not just Washington state. As when I talk about legalization, um, there is no um, banking for money that comes from um, 
retail commercial cannabis. So you can't use a bank. Everything is conducted in cash. Employees are all paid in cash. Taxes are all paid in cash. And at the end of the day, uh, at a cannabis store, um, an armored truck comes up to take the cash away. I don't know what they do with it at night because they can't take it to a bank. Um, that's a, probably another area for my next research. Um, this is a pretty big um, retail presence in definitely in Seattle, definitely in Colorado, and increasingly across the 15 state, other 15 states that have increased marketing with diverse products. So who uses cannabis? Um, uh, cannabis is one of the most prevalent um, commonly used drugs in the US. And in fact, in most of rest, uh, Western Europe as well. So use is more than doubled from 2001 to 2014. So cannabis use um, is most common in younger adults. And you can see in this um, uh, figure that there's an increase at all ages, except maybe the um, younger age of um, uh, like preteens, which is, I'm sure, very appropriate. I think that the, the teenage brain is, is very susceptible to um, the pharmacologic agents of um, cannabinoids. And I think it probably, these restrictions are uh, definitely um, well considered. So daily marijuana use um, has been going up, except in, again, in the younger age groups. So between 2002 and 2016, all age groups have increased. And most notably in, among um, uh, adults over the age of 26. And actually cannabis use has declined. Um, these are cigarettes that have declined. Oops, sorry. Um, but in general, this use of marijuana has increased um, over the past month. In these are in high school students. Um, so we need to look to the future about what that means. Although I think we just saw a decline in the last slide. Um, so the prevalence of marijuana use in the past month um, is generally um, smoking. Um, but also increasingly eating. So if you go to a, a cannabis retail outlet, um, there's much more um, opportunities to purchase drinks and um, other edible product, products. Um, vaping is um, increasing over time as um, smoking is fortunately decreased. Nobody should smoke anything in my opinion. So in the... Um, Behavioral risk factor survey, um, 2016 to 2017, uh, the people that use cannabis, um, in this study, cannabis was more common among adults with a medical condition than with those that had none. And use was especially common among those with chronic diseases like asthma and COPD. And actually cannabis, uh, cancer patients were among the most frequent users of medical marijuana. So adults with any medical condition were more likely to report using that, um, cannabis for medicinal reasons, about 45%, and less likely to report using it for recreational um, or adult use. Uh, the behavioral risk factor survey is a probability sample across the US. So this is pretty representative and definitely includes, um, it's a, a telephone administered survey. Um, Participation is pretty good. You know, obviously, as we all know, participating in a survey um, can be somewhat biased. Um, but in this case, um, they had a, this was uh, maybe, um, maybe 100,000. Um, no, that seems too big for weight. Um, but the people that, the individuals that participated um, um, discussed their medical conditions as well as their cannabis use. So I alluded to the policy changes that I think are, are so significant in studying and my being interested in being able to study cannabis um, because we have a new exposure. Um, so when I started in Wisconsin, um, uh, actually I studied beer 
um, I studied alcohol and lactation. Um, we certainly didn't study cannabis, but now we have an opportunity to study a new exposure. And I, I like to think um, this um, gave me an opportunity to uh, consider um, Dr. Graham's contributions in embarking on a new study and having people um, wonder like, why was he studying and why was he studying in relation to cancer? Um, I think we have an opportunity to study um, cannabis because of its changed in le legality. Uh, looking at cannabis um, historically, um, because it was so widely available um, and it had a, a pretty preeminent um, medicinal role, but increasingly over time, um, uh, in the 1937 um, Marijuana Act, it was termed the most violent violence drug in the history of mankind um, related to the legality. So it was then in 1937, federally prohibited. Um, so it was also replaced with a lot of pharmacologic, um, more probably more directly effective pharmacologic um, responses to pain and gout, et cetera. In Washington state though, the laws changed in 1998 for medicinal cannabis. So medicinal cannabis clearly um, has had a role for many, many years in pain and clearly also was effective in ameliorating the nausea and vomiting that can be associated with chemotherapy. So the laws changed in 1998 in, in Washington state. And then in 2012, marijuana was legalized for recreational or adult use and it became commercially available throughout the state in 2017. And it is available throughout the state. Um, it's it's um, more widely available in um, urban areas, but it's definitely available throughout the state. Um, it can never cross, legally it cannot uh, cross state lines. But uh, as you can see in a minute, um, all of, pretty much all of Western, um, United States has legalized can recreational cannabis. However, it's still considered a schedule one substance. So the drug enforcement um, agency defines um, a schedule one drug as um, a drug with no currently accepted medicinal use and a high potential for abuse. So it's in the same class as heroin, um, LSD and ecstasy. This means that it functions um, underneath um, because it's illegal on a national level. Um, as I said, um, there's across the United States, it's difficult to, um, although Canada has um, legalized last year, legalized cannabis throughout the country, throughout the Canadian country. So cannabis policy in the US in um, December, 2020, you can see that the blue states um, all have legalized recreational and medicinal cannabis. Um, I've, I have not seen cannabis um, retail outlets in Alaska, for example, but they're available and maybe I'll take a road trip now that the um, my vaccine has kicked in and um, see how things look across the country. Because even states that um, are sensibly more conservative have um, legalized recreational marijuana. And I understand that New York, um, um, just in this legislative session, um, uh, legalized recreational marijuana. So there's a huge um, uh, increase in um, accessibility and local legalization to marijuana. So cannabis itself, in addition to being more widely available, um, what is available has changed significantly. So um, this is, um, these are actually um, uh, as, uh, the relationship between um, THC and CBD. Um, so remember this is a plant and through um, um, plant genetics, um, THC is something that, um, because of its psycho psychoactive component, um, makes it attractive to some people. And so through, um, uh, through horticultural maneuvers, genetic engineering, um, the THC content 
of what's available in cannabis has increased remarkably um, from this is 2017. It's interesting where, where these samples were taken. They were taken from DEA um, seized samples of um, marijuana. So this is um, basically street marijuana that's been um, made enriched in THC. Remember, there's 100 active compounds and THC is of course not the only one. And additionally, CBD, which is ostensibly, we'll talk about it, um, has um, uh, anti-anxiolytic, -anxi um, so it's increased in sleep, et cetera. So we can also, plants are also bred um, for CBD. So who regulates marijuana? Oh, um, not epidemiologists. So the additional regulators tend to be, in, in Washington, um, we had a liquor control board. Um, and in some states they put um, uh, marijuana with liquor. Um, and in some, however, lick alcohol can um, be run through um, uh, banks, et cetera. You can buy it at a grocery store in, in Washington State. You can't buy cannabis in a grocery store. But importantly, public health really has never had a regulatory role. And the trend towards standalone uh, cannabis regulatory agencies sounds great to me because they should be um, gaining, um, in Colorado last year, $100 million dollars um, was generated in re revenue from um, marijuana taxation. So what about the health effects of, of cannabis and why did I get into thinking that, or why did anyone think that this might be an area of cancer prevention studies? So the two most bountiful metabolites of um, cannabis are um, um, the THC and the CBD. Um, and they're in, they're, they only differ, um, they do differ in their pharmacologic effects, the psychoactive for THC and um, the analgesic and the anti-anxiolytic for um, the CBD. They both regulate through receptors, um, extracellular and intracellular, and overall, um, the, these agents were um, only evaluated and only isolated the metabolites in um, the 1960s. And, as, um, and then in the 70s, um, the development of these as active um, synthetic, they could be derived synthetically and used um, for many of the treatments that we, are, we had seen for the plant products. So these are now available um, as um, synthetic um, dronabinol, um, naveline, and naviloxamol as a nasal spray, which has been approved now in the mid 1980s. So, for those effects, um, there's a clear synthetic um, action. And these have been shown in clinical trials to be effective in the treatment of pain and have been FDA approved for chemotherapy induced nausea, really have significantly improved um, patient uh, quality of life during chemotherapy. Um, CBD appears also to have some um, immune modulating and anti-inflammatory effects. So these synthetic drugs are probably not the same um, for sure um, because they are pure rather than a plant-derived product. Um, but cannabis in general has effects across probably every system in the body. And the therapeutic benefit of cannabinoids was is most promising, as I said, for chronic pain, for nausea, patient reported spasticity of multiple sclerosis, some seizure disorders, which has really, CBD has really changed. Um, this is a, a rare seizure disorder in kids. Some evidence for sleep, um, and many states have authorized it for a broad use. This, this is in states that have medicinal cannabis. The acute effect, effects of um, 
cannabis are many, obviously um, impaired driving, accidents, um, some memories and hearing in high doses, um, acute psychosis, and um, probably altered judgment. Um, it's, it's unclear at what level um, these effects occur. It's very hard um, to, to um, treat individuals um, with an, in fact, there's only one source in Mississippi of uh, plant-derived cannabis. So it's very hard to study the um, acute effects. And in turn, it's very hard to study the long-term effects. Um, and these may be cognitive, they may be a, ca a cannabis use disorder, which would be similar to alcoholism, definitely respiratory effects for people with, um, um, who have pre-existing disease and who smoke, um, sinus, fungal infections, um, pregnancy um, outcomes, adverse pregnancy outcomes, and mental health outcomes. However, how do you really know um, what the exposure was? And again, um, as, a, as a new exposure, I'm intrigued by how to study this. It also seems that cannabis might impact cancer. In fact, cannabis does appear to have a role um, both for inflammation and um, perhaps progression and other outcomes. So in laboratory settings, um, it looks like cancer might be um, impacted because of cannabis exposures. However, when we, we do an ordinary case control study of cannabis use, well, it doesn't see appear that cannabis use um, increases cancer risk. Um, so these are all of the cancer types. In fact, the current analysis suggests, this is an analysis, 20, 25 studies, um, that in the United States, cannabis use may actually decrease the risk of cancer by 10%. And this is in this meta-analysis. And the only cancer that appears to be um, increased is testicular cancer, and that's not statistically significantly increased. Um, so this is, of course, based upon self-report. So it's possible the bias could be um, that cases are underreporting their disease, underreporting their use. So no evidence there for um, incidents, maybe for survival. Um, most of our research um, in cancer cases have been conducted in using the synthetic drug, and these really significantly impact the quality of life, but we don't have any other outcomes such as um, survival. So why should we study this? Well, for one thing, it's something new for me, but more importantly, cannabis is used by the general public increasingly and legally by cancer patients and survivors, as well as the rest of the population. There's also some evidence that there are some effects on cancer symptoms and possibly outcomes. There's one study of um, glioblastoma where survival was increased, very, very small study. Um, and this was, it was actually a clinical study um, that probably will never be reproduced. Um, and clinicians here at Brad Hutchinson know people are using it, but they don't have any evidence-based recommendations to offer uh, patients. So for me, it's a new and involving exposure, but it also, it's an important public health topic. And just to summarize why, why I feel like we don't know more, well, there's certainly many barriers to the research, data monitoring, epidemiologic gaps. How do we define what, what in that cannabis store is the relevant exposure and what the doses are? Um, it definitely overlaps with other substances. It's seriously confounded with, um, so for example, with smoking, tobacco, and they're very evolving patterns of use. Look at that map of the United States. Um, it's widely available, but what is available? What are the products and what are the modes of use? So here's, a, here's what happened to me over the last two years. So for, well, I guess three years. So the American Cancer Society came out on their website and said, which I think was pretty remarkable, that they support the need for more scientific research and cannabinoids for cancer patients. And they recognize the need for better and more effective therapies that can overcome the debilitating side effects of cannabis. And they also called that federal officials 
should examine options that are consistent with federal laws for enabling more scientific study on marijuana. So I, I think of the American Cancer Society as being somewhat conservative. So this was, I, I not somewhat, quite conservative. So I believe that this was an important step forward. And here's our story. So in 19, um, in 2016, um, Um, I was in the field with a study, uh, case control study, of, no, cases only, cases only. Um, and we um, enrolled them through the cancer registry, through the RCR registry. And um, it's a study actually of subtypes of colon cancer. Um, and when we go through our questions about um, smoking, um, study participants would say, smoking what? And we realized, we weren't asking all of the questions that we should ask to ascertain what people were smoking. So we slipped in, and this is, I think, probably the story of a lot of my research life, is this was a funded study to look at subtypes for um, colon cancer. Um, and we slipped in these questions asking about what, what were these patients um, smoking or were they using cannabis for other reasons? So simple questions, I didn't really have any standard. Um, I kind of knew that I wanted to ask about um, what they were using and how they were using it and how often they were using it. So we slipped these questions in. Um, people answered them and there were no problems with, this is, they had for times like this, uh, pretty good, about a 65% response rate. So in this study, we now have about 1,500 incident cases. We have known suspected risk factors. So straight epidemiologic study. And now we have some basic questions regarding cannabis use. And at the same time, just up the street, um, uh, Steve Pergam, who's a, um, an infectious disease physician, um, was embarking on a study of cannabis use at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance. Um, he conducted over a six week period and he collected information on cannabis use. Um, it was a convenient sample. He passed out um, anonymous surveys and um, people filled them out. Um, so the range of cancer patients um, across all cancers, pretty low response rate, um, about 30%. Um, so comparing these two studies, um, I think, his study um, found that cannabis use, comparing it in a state, Washington state, with legalized medicinal and recreational use. And in comparing the two studies, um, here's our study, um, which is in revision at Cancer Positive Control and Steve's study, which was published in Cancer in 2017. About half of the people in, in our study had ever used cancer and about Half of those were current users, um, which I think is pretty remarkable. And it was, a, it was definitely a surprise to me. Um, and the reasons for use were pretty similar in both of our studies, um, pain and nausea and stress. Um, there is recreation here, which we consider adult use. These are not mutually exclusive. And we found that about only 5% of um, people who um, um, I'll step backwards um, because they're not they're not mutually exclusive. Um, recreation was the exclusive use of recreational use was only in five percent of um, our cancer patients, which I think is pretty remarkable. Um, unfortunately, smoking was very common, as was vaping. Um, edibles increasingly were common over time. And then the factors that were associated with personal and tumor characteristics, um, younger people were more likely to use cannabis, um, but old people were as well. Older people were as well. Um, and um, smoking was unfortunately more common. Um, and some, and um, cannabis use was more common in uh, later stages of disease, which is consistent with pain. So it seems like after doing this quick study, um, adding on the questions that we really do need to know more. 
um, the preferred method of smoking um, of was probably contraindicated for many of these patients, um, particularly if they're immunocompromised. So uh, is there some communication, risk communication? Definitely need to search there. The current users were more likely to have advanced disease. Um, maybe they, there are other solutions rather than um, cannabis at advanced stages of disease. And what about long-term survivors? The patients who use cannabis during treatment continue after treatment is ended. And treat cancer actually was a reason, um, although there's, as I said, uh, no evidence at all. So definitely need health education, communication, and other options. So I think there's there was a great need to know more just in, um, this is an interview-based study. So our interviewers spent a lot of time talking uh, according to the script, um, but definitely it was a common exposure. So if I wanted to study this, then I needed to have um, grant funding. So as I said, I went under the radar on the um, cannabis in um, embedding it in an existing study. And Steve Purbim, um, he just passed those questions, questionnaires out um, at clinic. He didn't really um, have it, he definitely had no um, financial support. So I need to find some money. So I wrote a grant, um, which is what we always do. Um, so when I wrote this grant, it was pretty straightforward. Um, I had just a little bit of preliminary data at this time because of changes in state level policies, making it increasingly a bit cannabis increasingly available, um, and the rising trend of cannabis use and, um, and cancer patients. It seems like um, the background was well motivated and the aims were pretty straightforward. Um, the patterns and the attributes of use, um, associations with health related quality of life, maybe some clinical outcomes, and specifically to look at recurrence and survival, which really was not available in the literature. But this grant was not well received. Um, in fact, it was not discussed. So there were some, I mean, I'm kind of over this now, but they said that the Pacific Northwest, um, because of our, we're so far away and we're so, um, um, non-Hispanic white, it really limited the generalizability of the populations. It's true, we couldn't actually act, accurately capture cannabinoid content and dose and product and strain and brand. No, we couldn't do that. But again, I mean, Saxon Graham had the same problem, I'm sure, um, when, when he asked about fruits and vegetables. Did he, um, was he able to get as granular as science might, um, RU was only valid, the only valid way to go. We didn't have a cannabis or drug use expert on our team, no, because we just got into this backwards. But we, we could do that, we can fix that. And the review was very, very critical about the inability to draw causal associations about cannabis use because it's not a randomized controlled trial. Um, this did go to an epidemiology study section, um, but we can't do a randomized controlled trial because um, uh, cannabis is a controlled substance, a uh, schedule one substance. There were definitely concerns about bias and self-reported use. Um, and uh, in general, I believe that the peer review, and I won't go through the pink sheets, um, they tended to think that we were writing this grant to support cannabis use rather than applying to study it. And uh, Cancer actually um, came down in press um, saying that here we are in Washington state, the pot dealer state, that's us, harms patients with cancer because we wanted to study it because um, we published on use patterns, the attributes of people who use cannabis. Uh, so I did take to heart the fact that, um, that I didn't have any, um, any way to assess metabolites um, so I did do a, um, another small grant with the UW Center for, um, uh, exposures, um, and genomics, and they helped me understand how to get the metabolites. Um, they would support the analytes, um, again, on a convenient sample, um, non-experimental. Uh, that one was not funded either. 
Um, then um, I tried to um, pitch this to, um, as I'm sure many cancer centers have, um, um, philanthropic events. Um, that one didn't get out the door. But then after making that presentation, um, uh, philanthropy came to me and they said, hey, you know, the sky is the limit. This is, this is a growing area and the cancer center is really interested. So they put together a proposal for potential donors and Seattle actually has quite a bit of money right now. You know, we have Costco, we have Microsoft, we have Amazon. Um, uh, so we revised our project, we met with donors, um, the director's office was a little concerned. Um, they finally did approve it. Um, they started, we started approaching donors. I started having lunch with people. Then legal halted the, any outreach uh, to donors assessing any of their potential interests. Um, our philanthropic um, content changed a lot. Um, we found um, a potential industry donor, however. We met with them to discuss um, putting together a sponsored research agreement. And then in 2000, the Cancer Center decided that we can't take donations from cannabis industry because of federal banking requirements. And I guess that means that we would have had to take in their donation in cash. Anyway, that was the end of philanthropy. But that wasn't the end of me trying to pursue this further. And there was actually a NOSI, a NOSA special award from NIDA that said that they wanted to stand, they wanted to study um, patterns of use in cannabis. So I wrote another grant. Um, this is, yeah, but good luck getting it peer reviewed. Needless to say, the grant was not well received again. Um, but I didn't give up because the National Cancer Institute um, put together a, um, a national uh, conference, a symposium on cannabis cannabinoids and cancer research. Um, and I think I slipped past this too quickly um, because I actually, a supplement um, request was amended to uh, the Cancer Center Support Grant. So we actually wrote another little grant and it actually was funded. At the end of this conference, um, the take home really was we need clinical trials, but clinical trials with cannabis are really hard to do. You have to get institutional support. Um, the sole sort for cannabis for any, um, an experiment has to come from the University of Mississippi. You have to create a secure environment and cameras and lock site. You have to have a site visit from the DEA, have an IND, and of course you have to get funding. So I'm back to, I'm, I'm not gonna do a clinical trial as, um, as the symposium suggested, but I'm probably gonna just keep um, pursuing observational studies and they do have their place. Um, but in this instance, perhaps just to characterize and not to examine outcomes. Eh, except maybe survival. So our new su supplement, which we did perceive, um, it's not it's not a whole lot of money, um, and twelve sites actually also received the money. So we have peers across the U.S. and one state, uh, North Carolina, um, uh, cannabis is and Utah, um, can no Utah it can get cannabis, um, uh, Kansas. Um, cannabis is simply not accessible. I mean, not available legally. Um, but yet they're gonna to try to pursue um, studying patterns of use. So for us, um, we're building again upon um, state programs work in our own work describing cancer, um, cannabis use. Um, we're gonna study cannabis across the spectrum of um, cancer patients, look at personal, clinical and social factors we're also going to develop a cancer specific item bank um, of benefits and risks of cannabis um, and evaluate um, insofar as possible psychometric properties. Uh, so, 
I think I've never doubted that cancer is prevented. When I look at um, these changes in trends, and when we see that, uh, obviously that huge spike is lung cancer, but when we see cancer declines in the across time in the same population and with migration, clearly cancer is an environmental disease. Much of cancer is an environmental disease. So it's very likely in my mind um, that a new exposure might have an effect on the, this is mortality, incidence mortality. And I like to think that um, Dr. Graham would be enthusiastic and supportive of me moving ahead with this. So I guess the take home is um, we have to look beyond what we already know and we have to invest in studying emerging exposures. Um, we might not know what they all are, but I think we have to take risks. Um, and we have to uh, be a little more creative about um, data, and data collection. And cannabis, because of its um, sensitivity it's, and legality, it could be that we need to be more innovative about um, data collection, trying to improve the precision of our exposures. Um, I, I bought a box of CBD and then I bought another box of CBD and it turned out that one box that looked exactly like the other box had a tiny bit of THC. If you ask me, had I taken THC or did I have any, um, I'd have to somehow um, figure out how to ascertain what was in that um, uh, mint from the um, cannabis store. We need to have expanded measures of these modifiable risks. And I think we, my cannabis questions are not particularly um, erudite and I think, or informed in terms of thinking about um, how people use it and new ways to assess the, um, of the environment. And how much is the environment impacting upon um, what people are using and when are they using it? And I think um, I am, um, I'm realistic, but I'm also very optimistic. And so I would say, um, I finally got funding. So I would say that the that, that glass is indeed half food, half full, and that perseverance really does for you. That's a each chain. Um, and I'd like to thank um, the people that stuck with me on this project for long enough to get it funded. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm perhaps being overly candid with you. I think that the National Cancer Institute, um, when you apply to a, um, my grant that I slipped my cannabis questions in, I don't think that um, they would have any issues with it, but I don't know. Um, I don't know if, if um, I was obviously um, funded to test certain specific aims, and this was not a specific aim, um, but it definitely could be considered to be a, um, an important uh, modifier of the um, alcohol and tobacco, the standard risk factor. So I'm feeling I'm feeling good about it, um, but I'd feel a lot better if I had more money. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Newcomb, for that fascinating talk and also for that information about the long funding process. I think it's reassuring. And I think we all agree with you that we'd feel a lot better with more funding. Um, we do have one question from the audience, a couple of questions coming in. So cannabis may have an impact on cancer. We know cannabis is predominantly smoked and we know that smoked tobacco hinders the effectiveness of cancer therapy if patients continue cigarette smoking during treatment. To what extent do you think the cannabis cancer link may be driven by mode of use, specifically smoking? Um, these are typed. If you, if you want to look at them, I will read one more and then I'll let you answer them in combination. 
The second question is, with the recent policy changes, do you think we will see a large increase in cannabis use in the 12 to 17 age group? Or are we already seeing this if we were to extend the graphs you showed past 2016? Does this concern you and do you foresee any big health concerns in this younger population's cannabis use? Uh, great, thanks for those questions. Uh, definitely, I think, um, no question from me, no question that um, uh, Dr. Graham would agree with me as well. Smoking is a bad, bad, bad thing to do. And in fact, I agree that, um, and I think the literature supports uh, that longer people that smoke, um, there still was not an increase in um, lung cancer risk. And there have been, I don't know, maybe five papers. There was, has not been an increase in lung cancer risk in um, people that use cannabis, but it didn't always separate it out by type. And our, it did not. In fact, it did not separate out by type. In our experience, um, smoking is the, still the most common um, uh, mode of delivery of cannabis. I'm not sure the use of it. Um, so if we saw an increase in cannabis use in lung cancer, then I would say combusting anything is a bad, bad. Um, and can you tell I am not into tobacco? Um, so yes, we definitely need to continue to study that. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I need to go back to my cannabis store, I guess, um, to ask them a little bit more about delivery systems. Um, vaporizing uh, eliminates some of the um, benzoic pyrenes that occur with combustion. I'm sorry, I think that I have to look at that question again. Oh, well, I guess I don't see that question again, but definitely I agree with the policy changes, the 12 to 17 year olds that have, it, as somebody who was 12 to 17, you can always somebody, find somebody to give you get you alcohol. And in turn, I'm sure that 12 to 17 year olds will have greater access to legalized um, cannabis that they can find people to um, provide it to them. Um, so I, I do think that that is potentially a health concern. And I do think that the, there are um, cognitive and behavioral problems that can accrue if, if in fact there is some cannabis use disorder in that age group because of the growing brain. Um, so I think the brain is particularly susceptible at that age group. Um, so I, I definitely have concerns with that age group. Um, the next question is about um, urine sample testing to estimate the types of cannabinoid exposure. Absolutely. Um, um, and my little project um, at the University of Washington with the ecogenetics um, lab, they were definitely going to try to work on um, defining those metabolites. We, there are a hundred different um, cannabinoid metabolites that we know about. Um, and I failed to mention, but C. Pergam's um, uh, convenient sample at the Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, he did a convenient sample of urine. So he just had some residual urine for cancer patients who were seen at um, Fred Hutchinson. So it, it was anonymized and he did metabolite. He was able to um, identify uh, metabolites at about the same rate as his sample. So I think that was really remarkable. Um, uh, so anyway, I think, yes, you can estimate the types of cannabinoid exposures. Um, and then I, I think this is an interesting question about opiates and um, opiate use. Uh, there's a thesis that opiate use will decline um, when cannabis use increases because people will use um, cannabis for pain control rather than um, opiates. Um, and some people think that cannabis is, um, is very similar to these three substances. So uh, for example, um, similar to tobacco, about the same population, but not really, you can't really, eat. there are no edible tobacco products. 
some policy overlap. Um, tobacco, of course, is legal across the U.S., uh, certainly um, a very commercial industry. Um, and alcohol, um, some of the same um, access issues. Opiates, definitely similar medical uses. Um, opiates can be um, produced endogenously as well as endogenously. Definitely impairing, and um, again, commercial um, pharmacologic industry. Um, huge addiction potential, potential, huge morbidity and mortality. Um, so concurrent exposure to opioids. I guess I don't, we, we actually have a, ugh, we have another study that didn't get funded um, that was um, at, um, going to use the Kaiser Permanente Research Bank. Um, and in the Kaiser Permanente Research Bank, they do ask a, a few short questions about cannabis, but they also can link to um, prescribed opiates. Um, so if I get my next study funded, we'll be able to answer that question um, about concurrent exposure to opioids um, where use, I, I don't know that use has dramatically increased. Um, in fact, the, the thesis in the literature is that it might have decreased. While we're waiting for the next questions to come in, um, do any of the other panelists who gave intros have any questions for our speaker? I have a question. Um, so it seems, Polly, from what you're saying that you are have agreed with the reviewers that it doesn't make sense to do observational studies um, of cannabis use and health outcomes. Can you talk a little bit more about that? I'm surprised that you would say that. Uh, I think I'm um, more cons... I think there's a lot of misclassification. Uh, the study that I'm, I'm doing right now, again, it's, it's an interview-based study NCI funded us to um, ask about cannabis use. Um, and the reason I feel okay enough about this, but um, I don't really have any, any um, this is an, it's not an interview-based study. It's a, an online study. So we identify cases from the SCCA, from, from the SEER region. Um, we get their name from SEER. Um, they send out a letter, they give them the link and they complete the interview online. Um, and they'll report and we'll have information from their, um, their cancer registry report and um, they'll answer questions about clinical social factors associated with use, their patterns of use, et cetera. Um, and we will be able to ask them if they'll let us follow them up. Um, and we'll ask about risks and benefits. But I think I'm, I am, Joe, a little, a little more maybe respectful, although I have no idea to say that the bias is as profound as we think it is. So I'm feeling like our bias is not so horrific because we have about a 65% response rate. And about, um, as I said, our findings on prevalence of use were about the same as um, the convenience sample at the clinic, um, about half had ever used it and about half of current users. Um, and maybe that's, I think that's pretty honest, um, even though his response rate was about 30% and ours was um, better than that. But the, the case control studies across the US, um, the prevalence of use, maybe there will be less um, stigma associated um, with answering questions about cannabis. But um, when, I, when we go back and look at the, um, impact of cannabis on cancer incidence to see consistently a 10% decrease. So Joe, do you think that's a consistent, um, potentially a consistent bias in underreporting in cancer cases, cancer patients? 
So I guess I was wondering if we could use it for looking at outcomes among cancer patients. All oh, right. So that's, that is actually, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing in our other study, but I, I still feel that we've got the same. Um, but in terms of etiology, I can see the concern that it's going to be, right. but we do, you know, we do, it depends, I guess, how strong the signal is, you know, we certainly managed with smoking and, and lung cancer, but that was a very strong signal. Right, and I don't, again, I, I think, um, I, I do have a, a tiny, maybe it's relevant, maybe it's not, um, whether or not there's um, social mores that, um, that proscribe um, honest disclosure of use. So I, I wrote a paper once on, um, maybe you remember this, Joe. I mean, it's not funny, because actually I, I took this dog and pony show on the road quite a bit. Um, it's on abortion and breast cancer. And um, yeah, it's just thinking the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this was, and uh, you know, I'm proud of this paper. It was in JAMA and um, there was, there was a, a very statistically significant, but modest increase in risk of breast cancer among people who reported having an abortion. And, um, and I spent all of the discussion section of that paper um, saying why I shouldn't believe it and why it was a uh, profound reporting bias. And uh, as my colleague Walter Willett said, uh, cases have the fear of God in them and they have, or, or the fear of death in them. They have no reason to not tell you the truth. Whereas controls, you know, for a socially um, sensitive topic, controls might underestimate and cases would tell you the truth. So that would uh, allow you to see that bias. So I, again, and, and then I actually, as I said, testified in some, um, oh, for the Southeast Philadelphia Transit Authority because they put signs on the back of buses that said abortions, abortion causes more and deadlier uh, breast cancer. Anyway, off topic a little bit, but um, I do think that um, there is bias um, in so much of what we do. And that's why I'm super enthusiastic about doing um, a data linkage at Kaiser Permanente. Still, people are reporting ever being cannabis users or not. We still don't have the granularity about what they might be using. Um, and I think that's a Tobacco is, is so standardized and, and, you know, I don't know when, um, have you ever smoked the 100 cigarettes in your life and how many packs and um, a pack years. So it, it's so standardized in how we ascertain it. Um, but of course, nonetheless, there are differences in the tar um, and nicotine in each uh, across the different um, tobacco packages. So maybe there's, you know, maybe I, I need to um, to not take these um, crabby reviewers to heart that there may not be as much variability. And, and I think um, if we could do some more laboratory work and I, and I don't know what, how, what that means because of the legality, um, um, I can't, we do have a, um, uh, a clinic where we could ask people to come and we could feed them um, well, you already saw all the reasons we can't do that. Um, yeah, it's it's tough, and I don't think Joe, have you or Tia, have you ever studied anything um, that that had that this degree of sensitivity? Uh, yeah, I personally have done a lot of research on abortion. Um, so yeah, a lot of similarities with the underreporting. Uh, we do, but on that note, we do have one last question from one of our PhD students who says, thank you for explaining your grant funding journey. And do you have any advice for early career researchers on when to give up on an idea? Never give up, never <laughs> give up. Um, uh, so Seth, can I ask that the question? Yeah, go for it. Uh, so what kinds of things do you want to study? Do you guys know Seth? Yes. Um, sorry, I'm just giving, trying to give him. I don't know if he can talk. Uh, 
I mean, oh. this is, it is like these different levels of control. Right. Yeah, he says he can't join oh. audio. Am I, am I on? Yes, you're on. Great. Yes, okay. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for um, asking the question. Um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in um, uh, environmental exposures and how um, the, they can be modified by the uh, greater neighborhood environment via stress. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested, I would love to, to be able to study, uh, for example, um, the refugee population uh, because they, in a sense, are assigned to neighborhoods. Um, but yeah, no, this is just something that I've... Yeah, you know, as you're talking, uh, you know, of course, I'm kind of an enthusiastic person, but I think um, that's a great topic because it's new. Um, so refugees um, have new experiences and um, man, I think that's, you're absolutely right that you, uh, you have, um, I mean, it's multi, um, multi-level. You have the individual, you have the um, neighborhood, you have the community. Um, and I do think, um, I actually had two students who um, did a lot of, you know, GIS and, and placing people in, um, uh, characterizing the neighborhood in a lot of different ways, you know, just starting from the census track and, um, you know, this one student actually did get funding through an RO3, but I think that's, um, you know, and, and I don't know, Joe and Tia, if you thought about where you get money for, um, but that's kind of social epidemiology, and but I, I don't know. I mean, Joe, you've been on the study section. Do you see, do you see that kind, those kinds of projects being funded through the Cancer Institute, through the Urban Institute through. So I'm not sure. Study, I th agree with you that study sections can be very conservative and um, you know, that they, you're supposed to have innovation, but in NIH very often the innovation is very small increments upon what's already been done. So um, sometimes when something is new and different, you have to try different methods. Like you were saying, you know, whether it's donors or, um, or supplements or, you know, it, it, it often doesn't follow the normal straight line. So, and so Seth, if you, um, you'll do a postdoc, right? I guess first you're graduating. Mm -hmm. He's a PhD student now. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so you could go and in your department, do you hire social epidemiology? Do you call this social epidemiology? The multi-level? Is there is a kind of emerging of social and environmental? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, first, when you said environmental, I thought, you know, my foray into, um, it sounds like I'm a dilettante. So when I studied um, cadmium, I was interested in cadmium and breast cancer. And we did a study in um, Wisconsin. In Wisconsin, it's, it's a pretty big state and uh, it's got bad winters. So we basically mailed everything. We did buckle samples in the mail. We did urine in the mail. We, we had people take their pulse and mail it to us. And um, so when they mailed us the urine, we um, assayed it for cadmium and we thought there was, um, is Gene still on the call? I don't know. Um, so we assayed the cadmium and I thought, this is, this is great. This, um, you know, we have a hard exposure, environmental exposure. This is great. Um, we also asked people about where they lived. And then we, um, we also did some um, uh, USDA studies of farming. So farming, cadmium can be a consequence of farming. So we did those environmental kind of backed into those two um, from um, land uh, assays. We collected soil. Um, so we looked at a lot of different matrices. Then I thought, you know, I really, really, really want to do this in a different population because, you know, a small sample size. So we used the Women's Health Initiative. The Women's Health Initiative had urines that were put away and um, had a lot of, as you know, uh, more information than you can imagine and super well conducted and standardized and, um, so we took those urines and we sent them back to Wisconsin where we did the, um, uh, the heavy metal assay. 
And there was absolutely, and this is a prospective design. So, uh, and we had very low tobacco, uh, tobacco, which also has cadmium in it. We had diet, which also has um, cadmium in it. We controlled for everything. Um, they're absolutely, prospectively, there absolutely was no association with cadmium and breast cancer. And I think that's definitive. It was a prospective design. Um, so not knowing what your question might be, Seth, about outcomes, uh, about where you live, if you can, I think it would be very complimentary if you could have a, um, an objective measure like cadmium, as well as your neighborhood measures, um, so that you had something that was multi-level. And, and good golly, isn't your de department, I mean, when I think about your department, I think of it as back to its old name. What was its old name? Social and- Social and preventive medicine, right. yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to stop this here. Thank you so much, Polly. This was really terrific. It was a great talk. And um, I'm sure we could go on talking endlessly, but we have asked you to do yet another thing in a few minutes. So I want to give you a couple of minutes break. Um, so we'll be meeting with the students um, in a little while. Uh, I think it's at 1.10, I believe. Um, so, but thank you. This was an outstanding talk and it absolutely fits in with the theme of, of Saxon and trying new things and going against the, um, the common wisdom and um, because it makes sense. Um, so I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. thank you. It was fun to come and it's fun to think about uh, what Saxon Graham would have done.